Hello and welcome back everyone. You're listening to Grocket.com's OGTV. This is the GMAT edition where we're going through the official guide to the test, like it says on your screen. <clears throat> we're going through the 12th edition to the guide to the test, the one with the purple cover and the golden writing, and 12th edition up towards the top of the front. Um, my name's Jim Jacobson. I don't think I mentioned that yet. That's me up there. And when we left off last time, those of you who have been regular followers of this program, we are uh, we had just recently started the critical reasoning section, and we're going to pick up where we left off today. Um, so we finished up with question number 32 last time, and uh, just a reminder, those of you who are new to the session, you will need a copy of this book in front of you. Um, I don't put everything on the screen for you to follow. Um, it's copyrighted material, and so that's not cool to do. The makers of the test and the makers of the book put a lot of work into it, and so that would be naughty. You do need an, your own copy of the book in front of you. I will, however, be reading the, the questions to you in the critical reasoning section because that's easier than giving an unspecified length of time for you to read it to yourself, and then we talk about it. So, anyway, we left off last time. We finished up with question number 32 on page 495, so we're going to pick up on page 495 with question number 33. And we may as well start. So, advertisement. Today's customers expect high quality. Every advance in the quality of manufactured products raises customer expectations. The company that is satisfied with the current quality of its products will soon find that its customers are not. At Megacorp, uh, meeting or exceeding customer expectations is our goal. Which of the following must be true on the basis of the statements in the advertisement above? So, you know, something like this where it says, which of the following must be true based on that? That's, a, that's code for an inference question. We're looking for a small logical leap that can be made based on what appears in that passage, um, something that the author must believe to be true in order to have said what he or she said. Um, this is different from kind of the more uh, broad use of the word inference. An inference might be something that you could suppose might be true <clears throat> when people talk about it kind of in everyday speech. On the GMAT, it specifically means something that must be true based on what appears in the passage. So, uh, and typically because inference um, passages do not really follow the um, evidence. Oh, don't be that way. There we go. Evidence plus assumption equals conclusion. Because they often don't follow that precise format, there isn't a whole lot of predicting that you can do about what the inference is going to be until you actually get to the question, or excuse me, to the answer choices. So let's take a look at the answer choices and see which of these is supported by something that the author almost says but does not quite say in the passage. Choice A, Megacorp's competitors will succeed in attracting customers only if those competitors adopt Megacorp's goal as their own. Um, that's not necessarily uh, the case. We don't find out anything about Megacorp's competitors. It's not mentioned at all in the passage. And um, so Megacorp's goal is meeting or exceeding customer expectations. Uh, if some other company had a goal of just producing the highest quality goods possible, if that was their goal, um, then they would perhaps still satisfy customers without sharing Megacorp's goal exactly. So for those reasons, outside the scope and it could still work, not A. Uh, choice B, a company that does not correctly anticipate the expectations of its customers is certain to fail in advancing the quality of its products. <clears throat> this sounds closer to true, I think, um, but the issue here is that there's nothing about anticipating the, 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 uh, the expectations of its customers. If anything, um, Megacorp already has stated what they believe its customers' expectations are, namely this high quality, you know, these high quality products. Um, and there's nothing about getting to a certain place before the customers get there. So um, that's this is not really an inference we can make from what appears in the passage. Choice C, Megacorp's goal is possible to meet only if continuing advances in product quality are possible. Well, what's Megacorp's goal again? Let's go back and look. At Megacorp, meeting or exceeding customer expectations is our goal. Now, there is their goal, only, and they want to meet or exceed customer expectations, and they say that every advance in the quality of manufactured products raises customer expectations. And so 
then as the quality of manufactured products increases, so do customer expectations. And if Megacorp's goal is to meet or exceed those expectations, then actually, yeah, this sounds pretty good. The only way that Megacorp can meet or exceed customer expectations is if um, continuing advances in product quality are possible. Let's just say they actually hit the maximum product quality. Things are the best they could ever possibly be. Customer expectations rise to meet that level. Megacorp can no longer exceed customer expectations at that point. They can still meet them, but they cannot meet or exceed. Exceeding is no longer an option, and so Megacorp can no longer meet its goal. Um, so actually, choice C sounds pretty good. Uh, let's check the other ones. Choice D, if a company becomes satisfied with the quality of its products, then the quality of its products is sure to decline. Uh, no, the, the, uh, the stated passage says that um, customers will end up unhappy if a, if a company stops improving its quality. It doesn't say anything about quality actually decreasing if you stop increasing your quality. So uh, that's going too far. And choice E, Megacorp's customers are currently satisfied with the quality of its products. This one I also feel like is, is kind of tempting because they're talking about their goal is meeting or exceeding their customers' expectations. Um, but there's nothing in the passage to suggest that they're currently doing that. In fact, a lot of times people set as their goal things that they are not currently doing. It's something that they are aiming to do. Uh, it's still too much to, impl to infer that they aren't meeting their goals, but um, it's definitely too much to infer that they are. So... Uh, there's really nothing in the passage to support the idea that they are either meeting or not meeting their customers' goals currently. So that's beyond the scope of what we can actually infer for this one. Leaving us with answer choice C, that they can only um, make their goal of meeting or exceeding customer expectations if continuing advances in product quality are possible, because that's the only way that they can kind of leapfrog or stay ahead of customer expectations. Choice C. Still page 495, oops, pen has to be turned on. 495, question number 34. Okay, so which of the following most logically completes the argument? And I think even if we didn't have that question uh, before the passage, the big blank, the big line at the bottom would have made it clear that this is a complete the passage one. With complete the passage questions, we absolutely need to to understand what the role of the underlined, the part that's missing is. Uh, very often it's a conclusion, uh, but sometimes also it could be it could be the position that the um, argument seeks to establish. So, or potentially part of the evidence, but um, those that the evidence relies less on your ability to uh, really follow what the argument is saying. Okay, Ferber syndrome, a viral disease that frequently affects cattle, is transmitted to these animals through infected feed. Even though chickens commercially raised for meat are often fed the, feed, uh, fed the type of feed identified as the source of infection in cattle, Ferber syndrome is only rarely observed in chickens. This fact, however, does not indicate that most chickens are immune to the virus that causes Ferber syndrome since blah where blah is the blank. Okay, so um, since, um, or, or basically this, so what is, what is the, under, the underlined, the blank portion doing? Um, it does seem to be, um, it looks like it's actually going to be some evidence to support the conclusion that most chickens, or that, that, that what we just saw does not support the idea that most chickens are immune. So in spite of what I just said <laughs> about um, the underlying portions not necessarily or not, not as commonly being evidence, this looks like it's a case where it's going to be. So we need, uh, for that blank, we need evidence to support the idea that, um, or to explain really. So this works kind of similar to explain uh, questions or flaw or something. The flaw in the idea that chickens are immune. Um, so we find out that the disease is rarely observed in chickens, but they're not immune. So the underlying portion, the part that we're filling in, needs to explain why chickens are not immune, but it's not observed in them, Ferber syndrome. 
Okay, so not immune but not observed. Let's look for that in the answer choices. Choice A, chickens and cattle are not the only kinds of farm animal that are typically fed the type of feed liable to be contaminated with the virus that causes Ferber's syndrome. So that doesn't really say anything about um, why the disease wouldn't show up in chickens um, when they have it. That, and that's what we really want. So it can't be choice A. Also, you know, again, who cares about what other animals are doing? This issue is about cattle and chickens in particular. So other farm animals like pigs or something, pfft, you know, may as well be about Martians. We don't care for the purposes of this particular question. Choice B, Ferber's syndrome has been found in animals that have not been fed the type of feed liable to be contaminated with the virus that can, that can cause the disease. Again, uh, while that may be true <clears throat> and increases the notion that it's um, not only spread via this one particular type of feed, we're interested in why um, chickens could not display the might might not display the disease, um, and have it not be because they're immune. B doesn't do that. Choice C: Resistance to some infectious organisms, such as the virus that causes Ferber syndrome, can be acquired by exposure to a closely related infectious organism. Again, that doesn't explain why chickens would have the disease but not show it. Choice D. Chickens and cattle take more than a year to show symptoms of Ferber syndrome, and chickens commercially raised for meat, unlike cattle, are generally brought to market during the first year of life. Okay, so on this one, it's saying that um, that it takes a year for the disease to show, and uh, chickens are basically killed and turned into chicken meat. Um, before before the disease has a chance to show. So this would explain why chickens could have the disease but not show it. If it takes a year to show, the chickens are already wrapped in plastic in the meat section of the supermarket or already made into chicken patties or whatever. So um, that would be, this is actually a good reason why, uh, or explaining, filling in the blank, why um, chickens could have it but not show it. They just don't they aren't around long enough to manifest the signs of the disease where cattle are. Let's check choice E anyway. The type of feed liable to be infected with the virus that causes Ferber syndrome generally constitutes a larger proportion of the diet of commercially raised chickens than of commercially raised cattle. So this is one of those false split ones. We don't talk about, we, we weren't really talking about chickens versus cattle and who's eating this feed. Um, we also weren't talking about relative proportions, so this introduces a new uh, element of detail that doesn't really affect our argument one way or the other. We're interested in why chickens could have the disease but not show it, not E. So choice D is clearly our winner. And now we get to turn the page. And it's really a we this time because, I mean, you should have a book in front of you too. Come on, pen. There we go. Okay. Page 496. Question number 35. Last year, the rate of inflation was 1.2%, but for the current year, it has been 4%. We can conclude that inflation, inflation is on an upward trend and the rate will be still higher next year. Which of the following, if true, most seriously weakens the conclusion above? So, um, you know, in our evidence plus assumption equals conclusion, we have as our evidence inflation went from 1.2 to 4. We don't know what our assumption is. Our conclusion is that next year it'll be greater than 4. And it doesn't even necessarily take diagramming the argument this way to see what the assumption is. When you make a prediction like this about uh, an ongoing trend, the assumption is that that trend is actually a trend and that it's going to continue. So the assumption is that um, really that it's going to go from, from 4 to something greater than 4. Um, and so in order to weaken this particular argument, we need to weaken this assumption. We need to say, um, yeah, actually, there's there's some other reason. So the 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 answer choice will be a reason why the assumption won't come to, won't be true won't come to pass. So we need a reason why um, the uh, inflation rate will not continue to go up next year. Let's look for that. 
So choice A, the inflation figures were computed on the basis of a representative sample of economic data rather than uh, all of the available data. Well, that's actually how most figures are, are computed based on representative samples rather than just using all the information. So that doesn't really weaken it. It certainly doesn't say, hey, um, it's not going to keep going up. Choice B, last year a dip in oil prices brought inflation temporarily below its recent stable annual level of 4%. So um, choice B is saying, oh, you know, um, last year the decrease, the 1.2, this guy was the, the freakish number and that the stable level is actually 4. And if the assumption is saying it's going to go from 4 to more than 4, and choice B is saying, oh, no, actually 4 is the stable level, that does weaken the assumption here. So that's the sort of thing we're after. Let's keep this one and keep going. Choice C, increases in the pay of some workers are tied to the level of inflation. And at an inflation rate of 4% or above, these pay raises constitute a force causing further inflation. Well, so that sounds interesting and relevant. It certainly addresses the assumption, but this is actually strengthening the assumption. Um, and that's not what we're after. We needed to weaken it. Um, so choice C, definitely not it, but on the right track. Because choice C confirmed the assumption. It said, yeah, um, once it hits four, there's more things that push it in, in a higher direction. And uh, that, that would have done that, but that's not what we were trying to do. Choice D, the 1.2% rate of inflation last year represented a 10-year low. So um, that one's kind of neutral. Just because it's a 10-year low, it neither says that it won't go above 4 nor that it will go above 4. Um, if the 10-year range is 1.2 to 4, <laughs> then you know 1.2 you know, being a 10-year low means that inflation will not go up next year. If the range in the 10-year period um, has been 1.2 to 20, you know, um, then there's, there's plenty of uh, evidence that uh, inflation could go up next year. So choice D doesn't really tell us anything. Uh, choice E, government intervention cannot affect the rate of inflation to any significant de degree. True or not, that's not what the question is about. The question is, will it keep going up? Whether government intervention will affect that is basically irrelevant. So that leaves us with choice B, this idea that the 1.2 was the freakish aberration, the statistical outlier, and that 4 is expected to be, 4% inflation is expected to be the stable level. Choice B. Still page 496. Uh, question number 36. Offshore oil drilling operations entail an unavoidable risk of an oil spill, but importing oil on tankers presently entails an even greater such risk um, per barrel of oil. Therefore, if we are to reduce the risk of an oil spill without curtailing our use of oil, we must invest more in offshore operations and import less oil on tankers. Which of the following, if true, most seriously weakens the argument above? So, um, the argument is that in terms of risk of spill, uh, tankers have more risk of spill than drilling. So in order to weaken that conclusion, we basically have to say, um, nope, <laughs> that's not true. So we either need to say that um, you know, drilling has additional risks, or tankers have less risk, or they're the same, or something like that. But the argument hinges entirely on the risk of spill being greater for tankers. And so to weaken that, we need to weaken that idea. Let's look for that. Choice A, tankers can easily be redesigned so that their use entails less risk of an oil spill. Well, right there, we are reducing the, use of the, the risk of um, spill on tankers, and that would weaken this argument that tankers are riskier than drilling for spills. So we'll keep A and keep going. Uh, choice B, oil spills caused by tankers have generally been more serious than those caused by offshore operations. 
this is a great example of, um, and while uh, clearly true based on recent news, um, the we, we need to be careful to focus on the argument as presented. The argument is entirely about the risk of the spill, not the severity. And so knowing that the uh, drillings uh, have more serious spills is irrelevant to this particular argument. All we care about is the risk, not how much it costs or how much damage it does. Choice C, the impact of offshore operations on the environment can be controlled by careful management. That's, you know, way outside the scope of the passage. <clears throat> uh, choice D, offshore operations usually damage the ocean floor, but tankers rarely cause such damage. Probably true. Damage caused is not what we're after. We're after risk of spill. Do you, I, 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 I'm sorry for sounding repetitive about this, but actually really focusing on what the exact um, scope of the argument is really does allow you to eliminate wrong answer choices pretty easily a lot of the time. So, you know, I keep hammering, it's about risk of spill. We just keep seeing these answer choices that don't address risk of spill, and we can just check them off. So, and of course, when you're doing this for real on the GMAT, you'll, it'll go even faster when you're doing it in your head than when you have to talk about it over the internet to people. So um, focusing on the argument really um, helps. Joy Z, importing oil on tankers is currently less expensive than drilling for it offshore. And those of you who have been following my broadcasts, uh, often I, I've, I think I've mentioned every single time at this point for critical reasoning, that uh, wrong answer choices often deal with time or money um, when the actual argument doesn't involve those things. And so this is our money one. Again, it's meant to attract those MBA minds out there, you future masters of business administration in whatever uh, focus or area of your choice. Um, <clears throat> they know that you have your mind on your money, and um, they're planning on having some of you choose those wrong answer choices based on that. So do not be fooled. Also, do not be fooled into thinking every answer that involves time or money is wrong. When the argument involves it, then those make sense. Choice E, though, totally wrong for being the money trap. Choice A, reducing the risk of tankers, clearly is the winner. Still page 496. But now we are on exciting question number 37. Theory and Lawmaker. <clears throat> uh, Theria's Cheese Importation Board inspects all cheese shipments to Theria and rejects shipments not meeting specified standards. Yet only 1% is ever rejected. Therefore, since the health consequences and associated economic costs of not rejecting that 1% are negligible, whereas the board's operating costs are considerable, for economic reasons alone, the board should be disbanded. The consultant then says, I disagree. The threat of having their shipments rejected deters many cheese exporters from shipping substandard product. So the consultant responds to the lawmaker's argument by doing what? So the lawmaker, so again, in situations like this, we need to paraphrase and kind of simplify the argument as much as possible. The lawmaker says, um, there's no no tan, no big economic benefit to keeping this cheese board or the importation, you know, the, the inspection thing. Uh, we'll just call it the cheese board. That's faster. So lawmaker says cheese board, no uh, economic benefit. The co consultant says, hey, here's a benefit. So that's the argument. And so we need to look for something like that in the answer choices. Choice A, um, is the consultant rejecting the lawmaker's argument? Yes, the consultant says, I disagree. While proposing that the standards according to which the board inspects imported cheese should be raised. Well, no, <laughs> that does not happen. Um, choice B, is the consultant providing evidence that the lawmaker's argument has significantly overestimated the cost of maintaining the board? No, the consultant per, uh, has uh, supplied an additional benefit of the board not strict that doesn't show up on the uh, in the lawmakers scheme or projection now choice C is the uh, consultant objecting to the lawmakers introducing into the discussion factors that are not strictly economic um, well the lawmakers 
uh, factors are entirely economic. That's that's everything that the that the lawmaker is saying. The lawmaker is saying there, you know, it costs a lot to check all this cheese, and even if the one percent that is bad went in, it would cost us less overall than what this cheese board is costing us. So no, the consultant is not objecting to the lawmaker's introduction of non-economic factors. Choice D um, is the consultant pointing out a benefit of maintaining the board, which the lawmaker's argument has failed to consider. Uh, yeah, absolutely. The, the consultant is mentioning that it provides a deterrent. And choice E is the consultant shifting the discussion from the argument at hand to an attack on the integrity of the cheese inspectors. No, 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 no. Hopefully you didn't think that was anything close. So choice D, clearly, uh, the, the uh, consultant is pointing out a benefit that the lawmaker had not mentioned. Well, moving on. Still page 496. I guess really it's 496 to 497 since it straddles the page. Um, it is, however, only question number 38. Which of the following best completes the passage below? Okay, so we need to read carefully and read for structure. The computer industry's estimate that it loses millions of dollars when users illegally copy programs without paying for them is greatly exaggerated. Most of the illegal copying is done by people with no serious interest in the programs. Thus, the loss to the industry is quite small because blank. So here we need a reason to support this idea that, um, that the loss to the industry is, is quite, quite small where the industry thinks the loss is quite large. In order for that to happen, um, we would... So the industry and then the argument have different views. Um, the industry says the cost is large, the argument says the cost is small. The ways that we could potentially weaken the argument that the cost is large um, would be, or really to strengthen the argument that the cost is small, which amount to the same thing. We could say that there aren't as many people doing it. Um, we could say that, um, well, and again, uh, because one of the points of the evidence is that illegal copying is done by people with no serious interest in the programs, um, we could, that, that statement suggests that uh, maybe the people copying are, are not that interested. So th there's an assumption here that interest equals um, money. That's certainly an argument that the argument is making, that uh, this, this loss um, is a phantom loss because these people wouldn't have purchased the programs anyway. Um, how else could we weaken it? Those are the ones that, that come to mind. So let's look for something like that in the answer choices. And if it seems like I'm spending too much time on prediction, I really do feel like taking that extra 10, 15 seconds at most to just come up with a couple ideas about what type of thing might weaken the argument, especially when you're doing untimed critical reasoning practice, it really helps you, um, number one, you can more correctly identify the correct answer choice even when it's worded a little bit differently. That happens, that's happened even over the, over the course of this broadcast, even this is what, the third time we've done critical reasoning, the fourth? Already it's happened, that you know, prediction that I've come up with uh, is worded pretty differently in the answer choice, but it's easier to recognize because we already predicted it. It also um, allows you to build your skills in, in kind of predicting what the right answer, what sorts of right answers there might be. So it allows you to eliminate wrong answer choices more easily, even if the thing you predicted isn't actually the right answer. So I really do recommend building into your, your planning, into your budget, into your mental budget for time doing these questions, taking the time to do some of that predicting. Again, it takes less time when you don't have to say it over the internet. So, um, we need a reason why the loss to the industry is small. A choice A, many users who illegally copy programs never find any use for them. Uh, whether they find a use for them is irrelevant. The industry is claiming that just the very, um, the very copying is the loss. That's either large or small. 
Um, choice B, most people who illegally copy programs would not purchase them even if purchasing them were the only way to obtain them. So remember that we had this idea of that interest in the program equaled money. That was something that appeared in the evidence uh, of the passage where it said uh, most of the illegal copying is done by people with no serious interest in the programs. So if they wouldn't have purchased, it, purchased the programs anyway, even if that were the only way to get them, those can't really be considered losses to the industry because those people wouldn't, they aren't, the, the, the illegal copies are not lost sales. So choice B, pretty tempting. Choice C, even if the computer industry received all the revenue it claims to be losing, it would still be experiencing financial difficulties. Ha, well, uh, financial difficulties totally outside the scope of the passage. The passage is not about the industry saying, wow, we're having all these financial difficulties because of illegal copying. No, they're simply saying they're experiencing large losses because of illegal copying. So choice D outside the scope, or choice C outside the scope, moving on to D. The total market value of, an Ill of in all illegal copies is low in comparison to the total revenue of the computer industry. So that does sound like something that could uh, weaken the industry's claim that they are losing a huge, uh, that it's a, a large blow to them. So choice choice D is saying the amount that they're losing is a small, a small piece of their overall pie. But the argument isn't really about, hey, we're losing money hand over fist. It's a big chunk of our income. The industry is simply saying it's a large amount of money that we're losing. The argument, the author is saying, you know, it's not even a large amount of money. Okay, so choice D does not actually address the contention that what the industry claims is a large amount is actually a small amount. So D, while it would weaken other types of arguments from the industry, does not weaken the specific one or strengthen the anti-industry argument in this passage. Choice E, the number of programs that are frequently copied illegally is low in comparison to the number of programs available to sale. For sale. <laughs> okay, so this one is saying that no one program is typically copied a lot. But that's actually sort of irrelevant um, because the industry is talking about the aggregate losses. Even if, e even if most programs are only copied, you know, 1% of the time and then some other one is copied 50% of the time, um, they're talking about all the total losses. So in a sense, um, breaking out, breaking down the uh, illegal copies into programs that are rarely copied versus often copied is one of these false splits, a, a distinction that doesn't introduce anything new to the argument. So it's not choice E, and it is in fact choice B, that if the people who are copying wouldn't have purchased it anyway, that copying is no loss to the industry, supporting the argument in the passage. On to exciting and new page 497, question number 39. The growing popularity of computer-based activities was widely expected to result in a decline in television viewing. Since it had been assumed that people lack uh, sufficient free time to maintain current television viewing levels while spending increasing amounts of free time on the computer, Oh, I read that as a new sentence, sorry. Since it had been assumed that people lack sufficient free time to maintain current television viewing levels while spending increasing amounts of free time on the computer. That assumption, however, is evidently false. In a recent mail survey concerning media use, a very large majority of respondents who report increasing time spent per week using computers report no change in time spent watching television. Which of the following would, would it be most useful to determine in order to evaluate the argument? So the which of the following would it be useful to determine is often, you know, uh, another way of thinking about what might explain this. What, what, which of these is a possible factor that could explain um, the results that they got that are contrary to expectation. So a little bit of prediction. What types of things could lead to people's... So we have this assumption that people don't have enough time to do computer stuff and TV stuff at, um, to have computers go up and have TV stay the same. They don't have enough free time for that. Um, and so the ways that we need to think of ways that this could, this could actually go on, that computer time could go up and TV time could stay the same. Perhaps people are 
doing both at the same time, watching TV while on their computers. Um, perhaps they're doing something less of something else in their free time. So they've increased computer time, kept TV time the same, and maybe they're spending less time sleeping or eating, who knows. Um, Anyway, we need a way to increase computer time and not have it be at the expense of TV time. Let's look for that in the answer choices. Choice A, whether a large majority of the survey respondents reported watching television regularly. That does not give us a reason that computer time could increase and TV time could stay the same. We don't even really have to think about it too hard. That doesn't explain the specific aspect that we are looking for. Choice B, whether the amount of time spent watching television is declining among people who report that they rarely or never use computers. Ah, um, so this is a tiny, so they're worrying about whether TV time is going down among the, quite frankly, probably tiny number of people who watch TV and don't uh, ever use computers. Um, so anyway, that, again, this creates a, a subset that just isn't relevant to the question. Choice C, whether the type of television programs a person watches tends to change as the amount of time spent per week using computers increases. Television programming, way outside the scope. We need a reason that TV stays the same while computer use goes up. Choice D, whether a large majority of the computer owners in the survey reported spending increasing amounts of time per week using computers. Computer owners, who cares about computer owners outside the scope? So process of elimination has gotten us, gotten us to choice E, and that's probably right, but let's see why it's right. Uh, choice E, whether the survey respondents' reports of time spent using computers included time spent using computers at work. Here, we have a reason that people could spend more time using computers and keep their TV time the same. They were counting in the survey time spent on it at work. Ta-da! That's the sort of thing that we needed in our answer choices. And look how far off all of those wrong answer choices are. Now granted, the critical reasoning uh, passages do tend to get harder as we go through you know, the official guide, and we're still at the beginning. We're only on question number 39. But, I mean, really, these wrong answer choices had nothing to do with relative time spent, you know, reasons that none of these had anything to do with uh, getting more computer time and keeping TV the same. They were way off, and so that's how um, that's how it should feel uh, when things are going really well on critical reasoning passages. The wrong answer choices will just be ridiculous. You say what? That has nothing to do with it. Um, yeah, of course. You know, you won't always have that feeling. I don't even always have that feeling when I'm reading a passage. Sometimes it's hard, but um, that's what it should feel like when it's going well. Moving on. Page four ninety seven. Still. Question number 40. In the last decade, there has been a significant decrease in coffee consumption. During this same time, there has been increasing publicity about the adverse long-term effects on health of the caffeine in coffee. Therefore, the decrease in coffee consumption must have been caused by consumers' awareness of the harmful effects of caffeine. Which of the following, if true, most seriously calls into question the explanation above? So. Let's talk a little bit. I, haven't, I, I talked about this in one of the other broadcasts, and uh, this is really a handy thing. It's a handy shortcut for causal arguments. So, causal arguments. Causal arguments are things that, like, X causes Y. And so, to weaken them, in our case, it was that uh, publicity caused the decline in coffee use. To weaken a, a causal argument, you do it one of three ways. You say, uh, no, it really wasn't that. Publicity really didn't cause the decline. And we had that with the bats, bats being feared because they're nocturnal and shy. And then we said, well, there's these other, you know, shy animals. So, and they don't, aren't feared the way bats are. So it can't be shyness and nocturnal behavior. So that there's, you, you deny, you, you show that publicity hasn't caused, negative publicity hasn't caused something else to decline. So that would be one right answer choice. The other, the, the second one is that you actually say that the relationship is reversed, that it's Y that causes X, that the decline in, in this case, that really doesn't make any sense. 
That would, that in this case, it would be that the decline in popularity of, co of coffee caused the negative publicity um, about caffeine. And yeah, it's not that. So, I mean, we can safely say that's not going to be the right one. Um, but the third one is that it's not actually X that caused Y, it's actually Z that caused Y. So uh, remember, Y is our decline in coffee use. We would want some other reason other than negative publicity about the long-term health effects of caffeine, some other reason to cause the decline. So our two options are, hey, look, publicity, negative publicity shouldn't necessarily cause a decline in, in coffee use, or, hey, it's this other thing that caused a decline in coffee use. So our, our good choices are this one and this one. Let's look for one of those in our answer choices. Uh, choice A, on average, people consume 30% less coffee today than they did 10 years ago. Yeah, I mean, you know, on average, that doesn't really make a difference um, because if the high-end users are, you know, consuming more to make up for that, for what the other, I don't know, I guess then the average wouldn't um, stay the same. But anyway, we need a reason why public the, the argument is specifically that publicity caused the decline, bad publicity about caffeine. And so just because coffee use has gone down, um, you know, that's, that doesn't really tell us anything. And in fact, actually, all choice A does is give us uh, some numbers to explain what that decline was like. We already knew there was a decline. It says uh, in the last decade, there's been a significant decrease in, in coffee consumption. It says that right in the passage. Choice A says, hey, there was a decrease in coffee consumption. Tell us something we didn't know. Let's check out B. Heavy coffee drinkers may have mild withdrawal symptoms, such as headaches, for a day or so after significantly decreasing their coffee consumption. While true, that does not explain that publicity about caffeine caused a decline in coffee. Choice C, sales of specialty types of coffee have held steady as sales of regular brands have declined. This is one of those false splits where it introduces a, a, a finer distinction that's irrelevant to um, you know, it creates two types of things when we really don't need two types of things. We're really only concerned about coffee in general and why it declined. Knowing that specialty coffee stayed the same, nobody cares. Choice D, the consumption of fruit juices and caffeine-free herbal teas has increased over the past decade. Uh, you know, this makes sense. We found out that coffee consumption has declined. It would make sense that that market share would be taken over by some other types of beverages. Um, but this doesn't give us a reason to weaken the idea that this caffeine, negative caffeine publicity in, uh, caused a, de a decline in coffee consumption. So totally not D. Choice E, process of elimination has gotten us here, but let's look at it. Maybe it'll be clear. Uh, coffee prices increased steadily in the past decade because of unusually severe frosts in coffee growing nations. So this one saying that price went up, that could cause a decrease in, in coffee consumption. Some people just buy less because it's more expensive. And so that of our two, um, you know, options here, remember we had this guy, which is, to, which would have been to say, yeah, look, publicity didn't hurt uh, tomato juice or publicity didn't hurt beer or, you know, something like that. So that would have been some, saying publicity isn't really a factor. And choice, this other one here, this, the, the third one on our list was, yeah, it wasn't actually um, publicity that caused the decline. It was something else. That's the one we're dealing with here. It was a raise in prices that caused the decline. So there. So that one's saying that price caused the decline in coffee consumption. Choice E is our right answer. All right. Uh, last one on page 497, number 41. Which of the following best completes the passage below? When the products of several competing suppliers are perceived by consumers to be essentially the same, classical economics predicts that price competition will reduce prices to the same minimal levels and all suppliers' profits to the same minimal levels. Therefore, if classical economics is true, and given suppliers' desire to make as much profit as possible, it should be expected that what? So we need to make a conclusion based on what we've been given here. So the evidence that we've been given is that similar products lead to 
similar low prices um, and also lead to similar low profits. And so if suppliers desire to make as much profit as possible, we need something to lead to higher profits. So if, and so this one, maybe this has already leapt off the screen into your brain. You said, aha, I see it. Okay, in this one, similar products lead to similar low, similar low prices and similar low profits. So if similar products lead to that, what could lead to higher profits? Probably dissimilar products. In economics, product differentiation, right? So um, we need something that says, hey, they probably need to make their products not look similar. Choice A, in a crowded market, widely differing prices will be charged for products that are essentially the same as each other. Well, that actually directly contradicts classical economics, and it actually says in the passage, if classical economics is true, so choice A is in fact 180 degrees, the opposite of what we needed. Choice B, as a, as a market becomes less crowded, um, as suppliers leave, the profits of the remaining suppliers will tend to decrease. I have no idea if that's true, but we needed something about dissimilar products, so that's not it. Uh, choice C, each supplier in a crowded market will try to convince consumers that its product differs significantly from its competitors' products. So dissimilar, it's the same word as different. Well, not the same word, different roots and all, but both from Latin roots. Anyway, um, here we have product differentiation. The products are no, not as similar, or at least the... Um, the suppliers are trying to convince consumers that they're different. Whether they are different is a different story, but choice C looks like the differentiation of products that we are after. Let's look at D and E. D says, when consumers are unable to distinguish the products in a crowded market, consumers will judge that the higher priced products are of higher quality. Again, that may be true, but we needed something that was a consequence of this statement that similar products lead to similar low prices and similar low profits, and so in order to make a higher profit, suppliers need to do X. Choice D, while it might be true, is not a consequence, consequence of what suppliers would do. It doesn't follow logically from what the passage actually says, so it's not D. Um, because basically the answer needs to be about what suppliers are going to do in order to try and make a profit. Choice D is what about what consumers would do. Suppliers, as much as they would like to believe they do, do not entirely have control over consumers. Choice E, suppliers in crowded markets will have more incentive to reduce prices and thus increase sales than to introduce innovations that would distinguish their product from their competitors' products. So here's one of those, those new distinctions that, well, you know, um, cutting your prices even more is cheaper than product differentiation. That might be true, but um, if anything, the, the, th the further price cuts is just reinforcing this, the classical economics model where they will all end up at the same price floor with their similar products. So it can be, choice E is not a logical consequence of, um, of the passage uh, because that would not necessarily um, cause them to increase their products or increase their profits because according to classical economics, the competitors would follow suit. They'd, they'd lower it to the same, even lower price, and then the pro nobody's profits would be any higher. Okay, so uh, turning the page to page 498, the penultimate question, number 42. Crowding on Moorville's subway frequently leads to delays because it is difficult for passengers to exit from the trains. Subway ridership is projected to increase by 20% over the next 10 years. The Moorville Transit Authority plans to increase the number of daily train trips by only 5% over the same period. Officials predict that this increase is sufficient to ensure that the incidence of delays due to the crowding does not increase. Um, okay, which of the following, if true, provides the strongest grounds for the official's prediction? So the official's prediction is... Um, so we have ridership and trains. Ridership is going to go up 
20%, trains are going to go up 5%. Uh, and we need a reason that crowding will not get worse. We're not necessarily um, getting rid of crowding, but we need a, a reason crowding won't get worse when the increase in train rides will not, um, the, the much smaller percentage in the train rides uh, increase. Um, let me start that sentence over. These two percentages don't match, and we need a reason why this much smaller percentage um, than the ridership increase will not um, increase crowding. That's their prediction, that crowding will not go up. Um, why might that be? So we can think about it. Um, we could say that, in terms of predictions, we could say that perhaps the trains are all really big, and um, so it takes a relatively smaller number, smaller increase in rides, train rides, to account for an increase in ridership. It could also be that the increase in train, that the increase in ridership is in like not crowded areas. Maybe it's suburbs or something like that. So that would be a reason that the ridership could go up but not make crowds any worse. Or maybe they're going to redesign their train stations so the crowding isn't a factor. Those are our predictions, my predictions anyway, since I kind of made them on my own. Let's look for those things in the answer choices. So choice A, um, by changing maintenance schedules, the transit authority can achieve the 5% increase in train trips without purchasing any new subway cars. So that one uh, doesn't address the conflict in these, or the uh, apparent contradiction in their prediction and the numbers that we've been presented. All it says is that it's not going to cost them as much. Uh, choice B, the Transit Authority also plans a 5% increase in the number of bus trips on routes that connect to subways. Um, the issue is crowding at the actual subway stations. So just because there's an increase in buses between those subway stations, that does not impact the crowding. And in fact, it says that an increase in ridership should increase crowding. It's not B. Uh, choice C, for most commuters who use the subway system, there is no practical alternative public transportation available. Sad, but that basically says that those crowds are there to stay and an increase in ridership will just make things worse. Choice D, most of the projected increase in ridership is expected to occur in off-peak hours when trains are now sparsely used. So, um, remember one of my predictions was that maybe this ridership increase was in suburbs or something like that. I didn't really consider this notion that it could just be at off-peak hours. So, uh, but it, it amounts to the same thing. The, the uh, increase in ridership is at times or places in some other location, metaphysically uh, or metaphorically, um, from when, when all the crowds are there. So this ridership increase, if it isn't at the crowded times, it's not going to make crowds worse, and their prediction holds sound, holds true. Um, choice D sounds good. Let's check the last one, though. The 5% increase in the number of train trips can be achieved without an equal increase in transit authority operational costs. There's your money trap there. Actually, choice A kind of was that too. Um, and uh, so really, again, that's irrelevant. It doesn't explain how ridership could go up and crowds would not. Choice D is the one that does. OK, let's do one more before we call it a day. I'm not really going to call it a day per se, because for me, it's about 11 in the morning. It's a little bit early to uh, turn in, but those of you who, uh, for whom this is evening, you can just go to bed happy knowing you learned some stuff about critical reasoning. Well, hopefully you learned something about critical reasoning. Anyway, question number 43. Installing scrubbers in smokestacks and switching to cleaner burning fuel are the two methods available to Northern Power for reducing harmful emissions from its plants. Scrubbers will reduce harmful emissions more than cleaner burning fuels will. Therefore, by installing scrubbers, Northern Power will be doing the most that can be done to reduce harmful emissions from its plants. Oops, sorry about that. Um, which of the following is an assumption on which the argument depends? So the argument, again, we always want to summarize what that argument, they have a choice between X or Y, and um, doing one of them is the most they can do.
And so basically, um, the it sounds like one of the assumptions is that these two are somehow mutually exclusive. Um, you know, because of course, one of the things you, you might ask yourself is why not do both? You know, if cleaner burning fuels and scrubbers both decrease um, harmful emissions, uh, why can't they do both? But the passage actually says that choosing scrubbers, which is the better of the two, they are doing the most that they can do. So clearly the assumption is that one, they can only do one somehow for some reason. Maybe it's too expensive, who knows. But there, there's a reason why they can only do one or the other. So choice A, switching to cleaner burning fuel will not be more expensive than installing, in, than installing scrubbers. Well, again, that's kind of the money trap. Uh, we need a reason really why they could only do one. And saying that one won't be more expensive than the other doesn't really help us. Choice B, Northern Power can choose from among various kinds of scrubbers, some of which are more effective than others. Well, that's good, and hopefully they choose the most effective ones, but we need a reason why they couldn't. They had to choose X or Y. The assumption was that they had to do one or the other. Let's find out. Let's. We need a reason why that might be. Uh, choice C, Northern Power is not necessarily committed to reducing harmful emissions from its plants. Um, well, I don't know. It's, it sounds like they're committed, and we need to accept the argument as true that doing that installing scrubbers is the most they can do. Okay, So regardless of whether they're actually committed, it sounds like they're going to do it, and we need to find out why that is the most they could do. So their commitment level is really outside the scope of the passage. It's what they're actually doing. Choice D, harmful emissions from Northern Power's plants cannot be, re be reduced more by using both methods together than by the installation of scrubbers alone. Okay, so there's a reason why they only could do one or the other. Uh, perhaps scrubbers don't work on whatever emissions are released from cleaner burning fuels. So choice D gives us a reason why they could only choose one or the other. Scrubbers don't do, don't reduce it more when they use cleaner burning fuels. Choice E, aside from harmful emissions from the smokestacks of its plants, the activities of Northern Power do not cause significant air pollution. Good for them. Outside the scope, though. So uh, really, that gives us only choice D. It explains why the passage's statement that they're doing the most they can by only installing scrubbers, choice D explains how that could be. And that is the assumption that they could only do one or the other. And that's that. And we stopped one minute early, so that's good. Okay, so we will pick up next time, starting with question number 44 on page 498. You've been listening to me, Jim Jacobson, and you, oh, that's not the underline. There we go. You've been listening to me, Jim Jacobson, um, watching Grocket.com, studying for the GMAT, using the 12th edition to the guide to the test. And uh, I hope to see you next time, or, you know, to the extent that I see you. I hope you see me next time. How about that?